Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our second lecture session and thank you so much for coming along this afternoon and those who came this morning, thank you for that as well. We have, as we had this morning, three of this country, if not the world, I'm going to say a forum because they never will, greatest Shakespeare scholars. It's been my privilege to, and it was pointed out to me by Dr. Paul Richards, that King's Lynn has never been fortunate enough ever before to have had five such people all gathered together in order to take, talk about Shakespeare in this town. And we're indeed fortunate to have them all with us. Matthew and Richard spoke this morning. This afternoon, we have Emeritus Professor John Drakakis, Dr. Peter Smith, and Professor Alison Findlay. What I'm going to do is to just introduce, first of all, Ali, um, John, who will be speaking first, just talk about him and what he's going to do. When that is finished, then Alison will, I will do exactly the same with Alison, and then exactly the same with Peter, and we will have questions and uh, everything at the end, and I think we have enough time for that. We certainly do. So, Welcome and thank you to you all. Uh, let me talk about Emeritus Professor John Drakakis first. Rather than me waffling and forgetting half, I'm going to read the handout that I've already written that you have in front of you. But let me just share this with you. This is John's biography, if you like. John Drakakis is Emeritus Professor of English Studies at the University of Stirling. He has also held visiting professorships at Wrexham Glendower University, where he was awarded an honorary fellowship, and at the University of Lincoln. He has published widely in the area of Shakespeare studies and is the editor of Alternative Shakespeare's, the joint editor of Gothic Shakespeare's, Macbeth, a critical reader, and two other books of collected essays on Shakespearean tragedy and tragedy. He is also the editor of the Arden 3 series of The Merchant of Venice. So the latest Arden, this man, edited. He's edited the Ard that Arden series and the first quarter edition of Richard III. He's contributed essays and articles and book reviews to a number of leading literary journals, and he is a member of the editorial boards of Textual Practice, Critical Survey, Sedary, Intercultural Shakespeare, and The Anachronist. And he was on the founding editorial board of Shakespeare. He was a founding trustee of the British Shakespeare Association and was chair of the Fellowship Subcommittee. He's an elected member of the English Association and a member of the Academia Europea. And he holds an honorary Doctor of Literature from the University of Clermont Auvergne. He is currently the general editor of the Routledge New Critical Idiom series and is the general editor and contributing editor in charge of the revision of Geoffrey Bullough's Narrative and Dramatic Sources of Shakespeare. My goodness. Let me say something about what John's going to be talking about. One of the other f uh, significant figures in Shakespearean history and is a gentleman called Robert Armin, who became the leading comedy player with Shakespeare's uh, company, The King's Men, in 1600. But he was born in King's Lynn. And John is going to talk. Let me just read you what John is proposing from his uh, abstract. Again, in, it's an, in front of you, but let me quickly read it. This paper attempts to establish links between Shakespeare and King's Lynn through the figure of Robert Armin. Armin joined Shakespeare's company sometime in 1599 after the departure of William Kemp, the company's resident clown, and he became a sharer in the same company. King's Lynn was known to be on the touring route for travelling players, and although Armin was apprenticed to a goldsmith in London, he was a native of King's Lynn. In addition to suggesting that one of the differences between the first quarto and second quarto of Hamlet may involve the expansion of the gravedigger scene in the second quarto and the extending of the gravedigger song, 
And this is what he says, I want to speculate that the first quarter may well be an earlier version of the play designed for touring and that this may have been the version for which the Chamberlain's men toured as early as 1594 when there was a reference to the play being performed in London but not in the company's recognised theatre. The links are circumstantial and speculative, but it's recently been suggested that Armin's arrival at Shakespeare's company produced a change in the manner of clowning and thus made an impact on Shakespeare's own writing. Armin was also a dramatist, and he produced a number of texts describing the process of clowning. While we can only speculate on whether Armin visited King's Lynn, the influence of King's Lynn, actual and metaphorical, may well have been palpable. Professor John Drokakis. Thank you. I'm, I'm afraid I can't see the audience. <laughs> I feel as I'm in a play. <laughs> Even my glasses don't help. Um, okay, thank you for that very kind in, introduction. I very often say that when you see the person that you've described, please introduce me to him. Um, <laughs> okay. This, in, in, in a sense, kind of dovetails in some way um, f uh, with what, what we heard this morning, although I want to be a little more specific about certain things. Um, and some of the dates will now be familiar to you. Uh, around the time of 1st of August, 1593 or thereabouts, the famous actor Edward Allen was in Bristol on tour with Lord Strange's men. In a letter to his wife, which was a response to one that she'd sent him via Richard Cowley, she says, I reserved your letter at Bristow by Richard Cowley. He's concerned about the effects of the plague then rife in London. He says, my good sweet mouse, I commend me heartily to you and to my father, my mother and my sister Bess, hoping in good thought the sickness be round about you, yet by his mercy it may escape your house, which by your grace of God it shall therefore use this course, keep your house fair and clean, which I know you will, and every evening throw water before your door and in your backside, and have in your windows a good store of rue and herb of grace and with all the grace of God uh, which must be obtained by prayers and so doing no doubt but ye Lord will be merciful uh, will mercifully defend you I'm not quite sure what throwing water in her backside actually means um, <laughs> I try to keep that image out of my mind but I think it means back door however rather than backside um, he sends this letter via another actor uh, a Thomas Pope Cowley, we may recall, was a member of Shakespeare's company, the Lord Chamberlain's men, and he played the role of Verges alongside Will Kemp's Dogbury in the 1598 production of Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing. Theatrical companies based in London toured the provinces, as, as, as we've been told, and for different reasons but usually as a result of the incidents of plague in London. And it may well have been that Allen was in Bristol for that reason and acting in a production of a lost play, uh, Harry of Cornwall. He was also with Will William Kemp, Thomas Pope, John Hemmings, Augustine Phillips and George Bryan. And the company was traveling to Shrewsbury, Westchester and thence to York, hoping to return uh, to London by the 5th of July, 1593. Now, in his book, Shakespeare's Opposites, The Admiral's, uh, the Admiral's Company, 1594-1625, Andrew Gurr helpfully provides a map based on the material he derives from the records of early English drama of the various places that the Admirals and the Prince's men visited uh, during 1594-1625. There's a considerable concentration of areas visited in the south, particularly around the coastal areas, uh, including, as the records show, Norwich and other East Anglian cities and towns that were frequently visited. Cambridge, Coventry, Leicester are often mentioned, and there's little uh, evidence that companies ventured further east than Hardwick, although I think that Matthew uh, this morning has uh, sort of uh, 
put much more meat on, on, on those particular bones. However, one reference to King's Lynn appears in the list that E.K. Chambers compiled in volume two of his book, William Shakespeare. Here, he records a visit to King's Lynn by Lord Derby's men, who were apparently remunerated to the tune of 20 shillings, but who for some reason, unspecified, were not allowed to play. Now, by April 1594, Lord Derby was dead. The Countess of Derby's company apparently also visited Ipswich on the 8th of May, 1594, Winchester, 16th of May, and then Southampton, all during the same year. And this company may have been chiefly a touring company, but what this detail of their itinerary establishes is that King's Lynn was on the route for travelling companies, and that presumably there was a space in the town uh, within which to act. Now, during the same year, the Lord Chamberlain's men were in London, in Marlborough, and at court in Greenwich at the end of the year, a company that still included William Kemp and, of course, William Shakespeare and Richard Burbage. Kemp was the company's resident clown, and he remained there until late 1599, when he was replaced by Robert Armin. Now, this doesn't initially seem promising, as hard evidence to support a connection between Shakespeare and King's Lynn. Although there's a tantalising overlap of venues and personnel that might help to suggest the possibility of linkage. More promising, however, is the connection of Shakespeare with Robert Armin. Armin was born in 1563 and was one of a number of children of John Armin, a tailor of King's Lynn. He was indentured to a London goldsmith uh, with King's Lynn connections in October 1581 for a period of 11 years, which he seems to have completed, and in 1604 he claimed his freedom of the goldsmith's company. There's an apocryphal story that links Armin with the famous clown Richard Tarleton, who apparently wanted him to be his successor as the clown for the Queen's men. Moreover, by 1592, Armin had already acquired a reputation as a pamphleteer and ballad maker, although the mention in Thomas Nash's uh, tract, Strange News uh, of the Intercepting of Certain Letters in 1592, distinguishes between Armin as a ballad maker and Will Kemp as a clown. The point is that as early as 1592, Robert Armin had already acquired an independent reputation long before the connection with Shakespeare and Shakespeare's company. And it's also possible that Armin had begun to develop an independent reputation as a travelling solo entertainer, a suggestion that the most recent uh, Dictionary of National Biography contributor of the entry for Armin, Martin Butler, derives from a comment in the preface to Armin, Armin's published text, Quips Upon Questions, which he published in 1600, which mentions sleeping in the open air and with only the clown's carved wooden batten for company. Now, what Armin's continued connection with King's Lynn was in the years leading up to, and including his position as sharer and clown in Shakespeare's company after 1599, isn't clear. But it's not unreasonable to assume um, a continued sporadic connection that might have included touring performances. Unfortunately, we've little evidence of Shakespeare's own practice of travelling and performing, although we're reasonably sure of his frequent excursions between Stratford and London. Until recently, very little attention has been paid to Robert Armin beyond the recognition that he became a member of the Chamberlain's Men in 1599 and continued in that role that up to that point Will Kemp had occupied until around 1610. Now, we know the kind of role that Kemp played, since in the 1600 quarter of Much Ado About Nothing, his name appears in speech prefixes alongside that of Richard Cowley, the actors who played the constables Dogbury and Verges, respectively. Now, in this play, Dogbury has a way with language that inverts grammar while at the same time appearing to conform to certain ideological norms. The interrogation of the suspects Conrad and Baraccio goes like this, uh, and I'm quoting from the 1600 quarto here, which has the speech prefixes Kemp um, and, uh, uh, well, yes, Kemp, not Cowley on this occasion. Kemp, yea, marry, let them come before me. What is your name, friend? Baraccio says, Baraccio. Kemp, pray write down Baraccio, yours, sirrah. Conrad, I am a gentleman, sir, and my name is Conrad. 
Kemp, right down, Master Gentleman Conrad. Masters, do you serve God? Both. Yes, sir, we hope. Kemp, right down that they hope they serve God, and right God first, for God defend, but God should go before such villains. Masters, it is proved already that you are little better than false knaves, and it will go near, uh, and it will go near to be thought so shortly. How answer you for yourselves? Conrad, marry, sir, we say we are none. Kemp, a marvellous witty fellow, I assure you, but I will go about with him. Come you hither, sir, a word in your ear. I say to you, it is thought that you are false names. Baraccio, marry, sir, we say we are none. Kemp, well, stand aside, for God, they're both in a tale. Have you written down that they are none? Now, this is kind of knockabout farce, uh, involving a reluctant watch that habitually sleeps, and a constable that plays havoc, literally preposterously, with grammar and the process of formal interrogation. A modern contrast might be between, say, the knockabout farce of somebody like Michael Crawford from Some Mothers Do Have Them, in the, the, the persona of Frank Spencer, and the more cerebral, uh, cerebral humour of, say, people like Ben Elton in his stand-up years, and maybe latterly somebody like Frankie Boyle. I don't know if Frankie Boyle has come this far south, but... Um, very much Armin-like. But to return to Robert Armin, uh, he's attracted the attention of two scholars recently, a woman called Catherine Hentz and uh, an Oxford scholar called Bart Van Es. Now in her article, Wise Enough to Play the Fool, Robert Armin and Shakespeare's Song Songs of Scripted Improvisation, um, Hentz uh, concentrates on the comic actor's connection to song and to what she calls scripted improvisation. Van Ess, however, takes a much more comprehensive view that begins by comparing Kemp and Armin. He says, Armin styled himself as a jester, a self-consciously witty and irrational figure who directed laughter at others much more than himself. Kemp, in contrast, was an athlete, an actor who specialised in physical humour and whose naive persona made him the willing object of jokes. The alteration in the principal comic characters of Shakespeare's drama was thus immediate and stark. He concludes by claiming that Armin as a performer and as a writer had a personal influence on Shakespeare that was as great as that of major poets of the age. Now, this is not, I think, implausible, as evidenced by the role of Feste in Twelfth Night or the Fool in King Lear. And Van Ness extends his argument to cover figures like Autolycus in The Winter's Tale. Of the fool in Lear, Van Ness suggests that the name of Armin and his jester persona was scarcely separable for the globe audience, and Shakespeare cements this association by naming the character simply Fool. Without wishing to stretch the point too far, we might argue that King's Lynn, through the figure of Armin, contributed significantly to later Shakespearean drama, despite the paucity of the documentary evidence to suggest that the Chamberlain's men, or the King's men, the company with which both were associated, ever visited and performed there. Conversely, that Shakespeare influenced Armin is also possible, since Armin's play, The Two Maids of Morclack, um, a children of the King's Revels domestic comedy, is larded with quotations of phrases from Shakespeare and other theatrical texts, and perhaps gives us an insight into how a sophisticated reader and spectator, indeed a fellow writer, recalled and adapted memorable phrases and sentiments. Vanessa's chapter in Shakespeare and Company makes a powerful case for the Shakespeare Armin connection, and by extension, the Shakespeare Kings Lynn connection. And it would be surprising if a travelling player like Armin, in a company that is known to have had a history of travelling, didn't visit his hometown from time to time, both before and during the period of his association with the Chamberlain's King's Men, uh, either on his own initiative or, to stretch Van Ness's title a bit further, in company with Shakespeare. The link between Shakespeare and King's Lynn via Armin is speculative, but I think quite plausible. I want now to stretch that speculation a little further and to examine whether in the case of what became a well-known play, such as Hamlet, that exists in two substantially distinct texts, the first quarter of 1603 and the uh, second quarter and folio texts uh, of 1605 and 1623, that there may not be another kind of connection. 
I want to go back to 1594 and to Henslow's record of a group of plays performed in June of that year at Newington Butts by my Lord Admiral's men and my Lord Chamberlain's men. And these included Marlowe's Jew of Malta, Shakespeare's Titus Andronicus, and Hamlet, among others. Now, the ardent three editors, Anne Thompson and Neil Taylor, print as part of their two-volume edition separate texts of Hamlet, and they trace the fortunes of Q1 from its discovery in 1823 through to its subsequent reception and performance. They acknowledge Q1's theatrical viability, and I can vouch for that because I've actually seen a production of Q1, a professional production of Q1. And in volume one of the edition, they mention the reference to Henslow, but they also note a reference to the play in the prefatory address to the gentlemen students of both universities in Green's 1589 edition of Menophon, where he refers to a sort of shifting companies that run through every art and thrive by none, who could scarcely Latinize their neck verse if they should have need, and who could exert phrases from English Seneca and afford you whole hamlets, I should say, handfuls of trans speeches. Now, the question, of course, is which Hamlet provided the wealth of tragic speeches in 1589? And more importantly, which Hamlet was the Turing text that was used as the basis for performance in 1594? Now, we know from a brief quotation from Hamlet in The Two Maids of Morclack that Armin remembered the Q2 version of the following lines from Shakespeare. The Shakespearean lines are, could you on this fair mountain leave to feed and batten on this moor? This is Hamlet talking to, to Gertrude in the closet scene. Ah, have you eyes? And then, what devil was that thus hath cousin, cousined you at Hoodman blind? Now, Armin's conflation of these lines indicate that he was aware of this whole speech, although he gives it a new and different context. This is the character of Hummel. I won't recall the plot of the two maids of Morclack. I've read it a number of times and I'm still confused by it. But it's too much already. Was I bewitched that thus at Hutman blind I dallied with her I honoured? Oh, you times, how have you nursed me? But no more Hummel hath branded on his mother's name an Ethiop's blackness and a spotted stain. Forgive me that and all. Now, the line in Q1 is, what devil hath thus cousined you at Hobman blind? And there's no direct mention of blackness. Indeed, a few lines earlier, Hamlet instructs Gertrude to, look you now, here is your husband with a face like Vulcan, a look fit for a murder and a rape. Now, having suggested that it was probably the 1605 quarto version that, Hamlet had, uh, that Armin had in mind when appropriating and condensing the lines that were originally part of Hamlet's speech, let's now turn to what's generally referred to as the graveyard scene at the beginning of Act 5 of the play. In Q1 and Q2, the scenes in question are substantially the same. For example, there's a proverbial banter between the clown and his accomplice of the kind that we find categorised in Armin's Fool Upon Fool, or Six Sorts of Sots, and later expanded and augmented in his A Nest of Ninnies. Um, fool Upon Fool was 1605, Nest of Ninnies 1608. However, in Q1, the clown has only one song, and it's four lines long, and it fills the brief gap between the departure of his accomplice uh, to fetch a stoop of liquor and the entrance of Hamlet, who asks his companion Horatio, hath this fellow no feeling of his business, as sings in grave making. Now the title page of Q1 claims that the play hath been diversely times acted by his highness servants in the city of London and also in the two universities of Cambridge and Oxford and elsewhere. Now, given the earlier mentions of the play in 1589 and 1594, it's not unreasonable to conclude that Q1 may well have been a reconstruction of a travelling version of the play that was published in much fuller form in 1604-1605, and that the title page reference could indeed indicate a number of years, as well as an indication of some of the places where the company, renamed in 1603 as the King's Men, had toured. One other point worth mentioning in passing is that in Q2, the gravedigger scene contains three additional verses of the song, or perhaps three separately designated songs. It's quite possible 
that this extension reflects the presence of Robert Armin, who since Twelfth Night had developed a theatrical reputation for composing and um, uh, providing ballads. The single four-line song in Q1 fulfills a specific dramatic function in that it spans the gap between the gravedigger's assistant's exit and Hamlet's entry. In Q2, the frame of reference is expanded considerably to take on board a discussion of the ravages of death and the funereal obligations and responsibilities that it imposes on the living, and it repeats some of the legal implications of suicide for the practice of Christian burial. The text that we have in 1603 quite possibly represents the cloning of Will Kemp, whereas the text of 1604-5 is that of Robert Armin replete with extensions of song and sophisticated linguistic humour that's directed outwards to the gravedigger's apparently linguistic inferior interlocutor. Now, for some years, the provenance of the Q1 text of Hamlet has been that it was memorially reconstructed, truncated primarily for touring purposes. More recently, some serious questions have been asked about the relationship between Turing texts and the much longer versions. What Lucas Earn, who uh, was referred to this morning by, by Matthew, um, has called the specifically literary characteristics of the long texts. Now, some 24 years ago, Laurie Maguire's very thorough analysis of the bad quartos in her book Shakespeare's Sub uh, Suspect Texts, the, ballad, uh, the Bad Quartos and Their Contexts, questioned what since W. W. Gregg had become a bibliographical orth orthodoxy. Earn's modest attempts of projecting onto Shakespeare's texts a literariness that would make them fit for literature departments in universities seem to be predicated upon an assumption about textual provenance that involves a sequential relationship. He observes, the gap left between the long and the short, the literary and the theatrical texts of Romeo and Juliet, Henry V and Hamlet, allow insights into this process of abridgment and adaptation. It earns claim that the longer text precedes the abridged text and that the shorter one is the performance text. Combined with Maguire's conclusion that Q1 Hamlet contains very few of the characteristics that have been associated with memorially reconstructed texts, internal repetitions, formulae, insertions, expanded clowns, role, omissions, etc., we're left with a bewildering range of speculations and assertions. Indeed, some ten years or so before Maguire, Paul Wurstein reviewed the whole debate about the bad quarters and concluded judiciously that the categories of foul papers and memorial reconstructions, both of which have traditionally been used to classify Hamlet Q1, effectively reduce what he calls complex and diverse texts to unitary origins. Both offer individual agents as the independent causes of quartos. It thus becomes possible to represent 20th century textual criticism as having been produced by the desire for a certain kind of narrative, one which calls into being certain individuals, solitary author or lone actor, for the purpose of holding them solely responsible for the production of the most diverse phenomena. Now, even more recently, MacDonald P. Jackson has sought to revive the debate about the relations between Q1 Hamlet and the Q2F versions. Jackson thoroughly examines the language of Q1 and Q2F and concludes that in the matter of the relatively, relative infrequency of run-on lines, the verse of substantial Q1 passages closely matched in Q2 associates it with Shakespeare's maturity, not with his beginnings as a dramatist. Further analysis of particular facets of the language, sorry, particular facets of the language of Q1 leads Jackson to the conclusion that this text is linked to passages of the period 1599 to 1604, and definitely not to Shakespeare's pre-96 dramatic output. Now, Jackson's conclusion is that while a fully-fledged theory about the genesis of Q1 is not possible, he does present reasons for doubting that the manuscript behind Q1 existed before the manuscript behind Q2, and that where Q1's wording is closest to Q2, that wording was not present in the Ur Hamlet of the late 1580s, but was first set down around the same time as the rest of Q2. 
Now, Jackson's inquiry is a way of accounting for Wurstein's most diverse phenomena, and it raises fundamental questions about imposing a monolithic narrative upon a text that appears to resist it. Even if we accept Jackson's own combination of textual patterns and subjective judgments regarding Q1, and the assumption it makes about Shakespeare's development as a dramatist, we're left with substantial fragments of an earlier version of Hamlet that might well have been the version that was toured in 1594. With this uncertainty firmly in mind, there appears to be more to the Q1 text than the claim of abridgment might suggest. The name of Polonius as Corambis points to a link between Q1 and a German text of Hamlet, De Beststraft Brudermord, one that Geoffrey Bullock classified as an analogue but not a source of Shakespeare's play. Much ink has been spilt in trying to establish a plausible timeline for the relationship between these versions of the play and a non-existent Ur Hamlet attributed speculatively to Thomas Kidd and also the possibility that Q1 may be a touring version of Q2 augmented and adjusted for the purposes of touring in Germany some time after 1605. Buller rejects the view that the text that lies behind um, the German version, Fratricide Punished, is the mysterious Kidian Ur Hamlet, but that memories of the Kidian piece may have affected the English text behind the um, Feshtraf Brudermord. Now this reasoning would establish a connection between Q1 and the German text, although the nature of that connection isn't clear. It would appear that there was a well-known Hamlet story, perhaps a formulaic narrative, in circulation from 1589 onwards, and it was this that provided a framework for theatrical texts that proceeded to adapt, appropriate, and embellish it in their own ways. The German version is, relatively speaking, unsophisticated by comparison with Q1 or Q2, but contains causal rather than systematic e echoes of both. Of course, which one was toured in 1594 is anybody's guess. Now, by 1594, Robert Armin was probably firmly established in London, having completed in 1592 his apprenticeship to the goldsmith John Kettlewood, who succeeded John Lonison in this capacity a decade earlier. It would appear that according to Martin Butler, Armin was already beginning to establish a reputation as a professional clown and balladeer. Although it would play havoc with the orthodox dating of Shakespeare's plays, it would be an entertaining fantasy to speculate that Armin might have actually acted in the performance of Q1 around the middle of the decade, and that it was partly his brand of impromptu verbal clowning that stimulated the Q1 caution. The Q1 caution is, and do you hear? Let not your clowns speak more than is set down. There be of them, I can tell you, that will laugh themselves to set on some quantity of barren spectators to laugh with them, albeit there is some necessary point in the play uh, than to be observed. Oat is vile and shows a pitiful ambition in the fool that useth it. And then you have some again that keeps one suit of jests as a man is known by one suit of apparel. And gentlemen quotes his, uh, uh, qu quotes his jests down in their tables before they come to the play. Now this speech is set in prose in Q2 and it misses the last four lines that in Q1 elaborates on some of the spectators' anticipations of the clown's proverbial sayings. In this, uh, <clears throat> is, is this omitted uh, in Q2 in the light of the extension of the gravedigger's part and especially in relation to the extension of his songs? If so, there is a retrospective irony in Q1's reference since Armin became a sharer in Shakespeare's company after he joined in 1599. Also present in Q1, but missing in Q2, is Guildenstern's reference to children's companies. Hamlet, how comes it that they travel? Do they grow restive? Uh, uh, Guildenstern, no, my lord, their reputation holds as it was wont. How then, says Hamlet, Guildenstern, faith, my lord, novelty carries it away for the principal public audience that came to them are turned to private plays and to the humour of children. Now this passage is rendered obscure in Q2, but it's expanded in F. In Q2, Hamlet uh, asks, sorry, big man. In Q2, Hamlet asks Rosencrantz why the actors travail, and he replies, I think their inhibition comes by means of the late innovation. 
The very specific reference in F is to an eerie of children, little iasses that cry out on top of the question and are most tyrannically clapped for it. While in Q2 may be an historical reference to the political disturbances surrounding events like the Essex Rebellion, or perhaps the children's companies, or even prohibition of performances relating to the plague, is more specific in Q1 and absolutely specific in F. The F reading may be explanatory for an audience of readers removed by some 23 years from the controversy surrounding the competition between adult and children's companies around the turn of the century, while the vaguer reference in Q1 may refer to what throughout the 1590s may have been a growing threat to the adult company from their children's rivals. This takes us back to the various reasons for touring and to the speculation that Shakespeare's companies may have visited King's Lynn and that Robert Armin may have returned with them, possibly with a production of Hamlet. If we wanted to extend the speculation further, we might suggest that the one hypothetical visit the text used was Q, that, that on the one hypothetical visit the text used was Q1, and on another Q2. One where Kemp played the role of the gravedigger, and the other where Armin had taken over the part and was returning home to display his distinctive clowning and singing talents. And in King's Lynn, there was a fitting performance space, St George's Guild Hall, as we've already heard, which, according to the Guardian weekend for the 12th of January this year, is, quote, the only remaining theatre in the world that can claim Shakespeare performed there. So it must be true. <laughs> Perhaps one of the reasons why Hamlet was an attractive proposition for companies who travelled is that in all of its texts it contains a cameo appearance of a travelling company, the tragedians who visit Elsinore and whose presentation of the mousetrap is so effective in justifying the necessity of dramatic performance per se. Moreover, the version of the encounter between Hamlet and the gravedigger, with which Armin would have been intimately familiar, allowed him to showcase his talents for metropolitan audiences, but also to give provincial audiences a glimpse of what a London performance might have been like. Indeed, we might argue, contra Lucas Earn, that the 1605 text of the play that we have is not emphatically not a fixed literary phenomenon, but a snapshot of an evolving theatrical text, one that continued beyond Shakespeare's and Armin's life into the first folio of 1623. It's not only its transformation into a literary text edited to make it suitable for solitary readers that has given it a degree of stability, that the occasion uh, of the play's early printings appear only circumstantially to support. The Q1 Gravedigger scene begins with a 32-line dialogue between the clown and his accomplice, in which the first 18 lines are taken up with a discussion of whether Ophelia has been drowned or whether she's drowned herself. The issue is whether her social status has determined the manner of her burial. But I see she hath Christine burial because she is a great one. The Gravedigger clown proceeds to gloss this. Marry more's the pity the great folk should have more authority to hang or drown themselves more than other people. He then follows directly with a proverbial conundrum that he poses to his assistant, who builds strongest of a mason, a shipwright, or a carpenter. Now looked at from the perspective of Q1 or F, uh, sorry, Q2 or F, the Q1 version would seem to be deliberately shortened. But looked at from the perspective of a dynamic text in which the clown's part has grown exponentially, Q2 extends it considerably, added an ext adding an extended logical explanation that traverses the larger context of the law generally. The clown's quasi-philosophical demonstration is then measured against Cronus Quest law and the more controversial, egalitarian, but no less proverbial point that Adam was a gentleman. It's this that leads into a justification for the superiority of the gravedigger's profession. The dismissal of his assistant and the first snatch of song before the entrance of Hamlet and Horatio. This demonstration of the clown's loquacity is rendered retrospectively ironical considering Hamlet's early strictures on what the clown should say. Q1 keeps the controversy to a minimum. But Q2 gives the fooling a thoughtful political edge that challenges the precarious order that Claudius' regime attempts to sustain. Q1 has the clown repeat the verse of his song that simply reinforces Hamlet's question to Horatio, hath this fellow any feeling of himself that is thus merry in his making of a grave? 
However, both texts have Horatio reprising the point that custom hath made in it a property of easiness. Custom hath made in, 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 in made it in him seem nothing. Both texts allow Hamlet and Horatio to reflect on the identities of the skulls that the gravedigger unearths. But Q2, unlike Q1, also glosses the ground rules of the dialogue between Hamlet and the gravedigger. How absolute is Hamlet, this knave is, we must speak by the card or else equivocation will undo us. Although, of course, Claudius has been characterised throughout as an equivocator, he is not, like the later Macbeth, the victim of some supernatural equivocation that lies like truth. Q2's focus upon language uh, is given an explicitly political emphasis in that it points to extra theatrical social pressures that challenge status. The age is grown so picked that the toe of the peasant comes so near to the heel of the courtier he galls his kibe. The clown's capacity to exploit meaning and to demonstrate the challenge that it poses to order is reminiscent of the figure of Feste in the earlier play Twelfth Night, that's arguably one of Armin's first roles in Shakespeare's company. For example, this exchange with Viola anticipates the exchange with Hamlet. Viola, art thou a churchman? Feste, no such matter, sir, I do live by the church, for I do live at my house, and my house doth stand by the church. Viola, so thou mayst say the king lies by a beggar, if a beggar dwell near him, or the church stands by thy table, if thy table stand by the church. Feste, you have said, sir, to see this age, a sentence is but a cheveril glove to a good wit, how quickly the wrong side may be, tur may be turned out. Now, there's a degree of linguistic self-consciousness here that's absent from the role, uh, from a role such as Dogberry in Much Ado. Dogberry is a figure of fun, even though he has access to the knowledge that will expose the villainy of the bastard Don John. The wit of the gravedigger is piercing and satirical, evidence of a degree of smug self-possession that allows us to laugh with him rather than at him, and of a piece with the roles of Touchstone in As You Like It, the scabrous figure of Thersites in Troilus and Cressida, Parolles in All's Well That Ends Well, and of course the fool in King Lear. Now it's this kind of fooling, augmented with dexterity in composing and singing, evident in the figure of Feste and perhaps parodied in Hamlet, or even caricatured in the figure of the ballad seller Autolycus in The Winter's Tale, that indicates what the native of King's Lynn brought to Shakespeare's company. In conclusion, if we can't prove from documentary evidence that Armin ever returned to King's Lynn as part of a touring company, or that Shakespeare ever visited this thriving town, it would be fair to say that Armin carried King's Lynn around with him. We very little clear evidence beyond the circumstantial variety to demonstrate that Shakespeare travelled regularly between London and Stratford, although of course Ben Elton's upstart Crow has tried brilliantly to supply that deficiency along with a variety of ingenious and hilarious suggestions of the creative stimuli and the critical context within which the plays were written and received. The best we can say is that given its geographical location, we know that King's Lynn was on the touring route for theatrical companies and that it had the facilities to accommodate them. Given that after 1599, a native of King's Lynn played an important part in helping to shape the theatrical output of the King's Men, it seems highly likely that the town received the players, indeed even Shakespeare himself. And it may well be that somewhere in somebody's attic in the town, there waits to be discovered a cache of papers that will provide incontrovertible evidence to support what at the moment must remain a very strong possibility. Thank you. John, John thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, um, next we have Professor Alison Findlay. Uh, let me again just read what we have here of Alison's biography just to, to introduce her properly. Alison Findlay is Professor of Renaissance Drama at Lancaster University and Chair of the British Shakespeare Association. 
Her books include Illegitimate Play at Power of, of 1994, A Feminist Perspective on Renaissance Drama, 1999, Women in Shakespeare, 2010. She co-edited Twelfth Night, a, a critical reader in 2014, and Shakespeare in Greece in 2017, both for Arden. Alison is a co-investigator on the AHRC Encyclopedia of Shakespeare's Language Project at Lancaster, which uses corpus linguistics to explore the Shakespeare's language at multiple levels, words, phrases, semantic themes, the linguistic profiles of character and plays, and what such words would have meant for early modern spectators and readers. Alison also researches the drama of Shakespeare's sisters, or female contemporaries. Editing and staging their work, she is founding director of the Rose from Shakespeare on speech, uh, sorry, of the, I'm so sorry, I'm jumping lines. She's founding director of the Rose Company, which has stayed, staged Lady Jane Lumley's Ephigenia at Aulis. So that's written circa 1555. And I Have a Speech of Fire, a collage of dialogues from Shakespeare on speech, silence, and gender. Alison is co-author of Women in Dramatic Production, 1550 to 1700, and author of Playing Spaces in Early Women's Drama, 2006. She has currently produced a site-specific performance of Lady Mary Roth's Love's Victory, circa 1617 to 19, at Penshurst Place, and is currently editing the manuscript for publication by Revel's Plays. Well. And this is what Alison will be talking about today, her own abstract. Her, her talk is called Shakespeare's Leading Boys. And this is what uh, her overall statement is about that. It is well known that boy actors played female characters, the woman's part. But as they grew older, how did their roles change? Many of the apprentices carried on in the theatre long after their voices had broken and they had completed their term of apprenticeship, as research by David Cathman and Richard Dutton has shown. This talk will use what we know from later records to construct an argument about the boy actors apprentice to play female roles in Henry VI Parts 2 and 3 and Taming of the Shrew, plays associated with 1592 when Kingsland's town book records a payment to Pembroke's men. Lovely. Thank you very Professor Alison Finlay. Okay, you, um, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Andrew, for inviting me, and thank you all for coming. Um, you should have had a handout um, with quotations on, because in order to kind of illustrate my talk, um, I produced um, some quotations, because I thought it would be easier for you to follow. So if we could have house lights up a bit, if that would be too uncomfortable to people, um, you'll be able to follow those more easily. Okay, so my contribution builds on what or we've already heard, those of you who were here this morning, from Matthew and Richard um, about the touring schedules of the companies and from um, John's talk um, about the idea of Armin um, influencing, at least taking something of King's Lynn with him um, to London uh, as an apprentice through, through his own apprenticeship um, and his work with the, the King's men. I'm going to focus on another dimension of the playing companies, though the use of those boy actors to play the women's parts. Shakespeare gives a comic portrait of such practices in A Midsummer Night's Dream in the character of Flute the Bellows Mender. He wants to play the role of a wandering knight, the romantic hero in the drama of Pyramus and Thisbe that he's told um, is going to be performed for the Duke's wedding. But he's told that he's got to play Thisbe um, in spite of his protests that he's got a beard coming and he can't play the woman's part. Now, although the Rude Mechanicals play is absurdly comic, 
um, when we see it staged in Act 5 of Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, Sam Rockwell's performance um, in the, 15, uh, the 1999 film um, directed by Michael Hoffman, which you've got a little picture of on the handout, gave a wonderfully poignant sense of how the boy actor could also perform tragedy. And we've got to remember that Shakespeare was confident enough to write female roles for actors like the actor who played Cleopatra later on, and very long roles like the actor who went on to play Rosalind, the longest female role in Shakespeare. So he had confidence in boy actors being able to play both comedy and tragedy. We get another picture of the boy actor directed to play a weeping woman at the opening of Taming of the Shrew, one of the plays associated with Pembroke's men. The shrew taming story is introduced by a scene in which the drunken beggar, Christopher Sly, is tricked by a lord into believing that he is a lord, that he himself is a lord, and he's fallen into a trance and he's grieved his lady, his wife. But now that he's woken up, the players are going to come and entertain him. So it's a kind of cameo of the kind of performance that Richard outlined this morning that might have taken place on a raised platform here. As part of the entertainment, um, Bartholomew, who is a page of the real Lord, is directed to play the lady. He must give play the lady to Christopher Sly's Lord. And he's got to play it by getting an onion and putting it inside a handkerchief so it's going to make him cry. And the Lord promises to give you give thee more instruction, drawing attention to the importance of education in the play for both the boy actor and for the characters. And he says, I know the boy will well usurp the grace, voice and gait and action of a gentlewoman. Bartholomew, as the lady, does indeed convince Christopher Sly and he gives a prologue to the taming plot of the main play which happens when he says in the lady's lines, and this is quoted on your handout, my husband and my lord, my lord and husband, I am your wife in all obedience. And what we see in the play when Katerina comes on is not an obedient wife, but where we end up is with the obedient wife. And I'm interested to speculate, Christopher Sly disappears um, in the uh, Shakespeare text, not in the source text or a source text, The Taming of Ashru, but in the Shakespeare text he disappears. So did the lords of Kings Lynn Parish or whichever parish in which this was played, the mayor and the other nobles, did they take the part of the lord if they were sitting at the back of the stage behind the performance area? Christopher Sly um, responds to the lady saying that she's going to be obedient, saying, I know it well, you are going to be obedient, pointing up the propriety of wifely submission, even though he doesn't know what he's going to call this lady. Uh, is my obedient wife Alice Madam or Joan Madam, he says, so he doesn't even know. Because this is a very self-conscious performance, a performance within a performance, the snapshot of womanly submission that it shows is undoubtedly, um, deliberately, if you like, advertised as an exclusively male fantasy. It's all performed by men. And we're made aware of that as members of the audience. The taming plot which follows is undoubtedly extremely offensive, with Petruchio using emotional and physical abuse of Catherine, the shrew, Yet at the same time, the play retains that self-conscious theatricality. And I want to give a, a taste of that by looking at um, a scene in Act, a section of Act 4, Scene 5. Um, so David, would you come and read Petruchio for me in this, and I'll read Catherine. Okay, um, so conduct books of the, the period um, 
lectured on female behaviour and frequently used the metaphor of the sun for the lord or master of the household and the moon for the wifely uh, picture of submission. Um, but in this scene, we get a sort of playfulness on this. What happens is that Petruchio and Caterina are returning to her father's house um, after a long struggle at the taming school for Petruchio to dominate Catherine. Um, and they set off on the journey and Petruchio begins. Good Lord, how bright and goodly shines the moon. The moon? The sun! It is not moonlight now. I say it is the moon that shines so bright. I know it is the sun that shines so bright. Now by my mother's sun and that is me, that shall be moon or star or what I say, or ere I journey to your father's house. Go on and fetch your horses back again, ever more crossed and crossed, nothing but crossed. And a gentleman who's accompanying them, Hortensio, says to Caterina, say as he says, or we shall never go. <laughs> so Catherine says, forward, I pray, since we have come so far, and be it moon or sun or what you please, and if you please to call it a rushed candle, henceforth I vow it shall be so for me. I say it is the moon. I know it is the moon. Nay, then you lie, it is the blessed sun. Then God be blessed, it is the blessed sun. But sun it is not when you say it is not, and the moon changes even with your mind. What you will have it named, even that it is. And so it shall be still for Catherine. And at that point, Hortensio comes back in and says, well, go thy ways, Petruchio, the field is won. <laughs> Catherine appears to abide by the conventions of male supremacy that go back to the book of Genesis where Adam is given the power to name everything in creation. But she does so with a verbal dexterity that outwits him. It is she who is constant, like the sun, and so it shall be still for Catherine, while the moon changes even with his mind. Thus Hortensio may say that Petruchio has won the field, but the play shows that the taming school has taught Catherine how to play the game of submission and invert its principles at the same time through the very act of speaking. For the boy actor and the character the plot is an education in finding a voice that ultimately takes centre stage at the end of the show in a speech of 44 lines of the last scene, the longest speech in the play. I don't want to dwell on it now, but rhetorically, that infamous speech of wifely submission uses the same techniques of inversion or reversal that, in fact, John was talking about in the, the Gravedigger uh, scene and that we've just had in the Sun and Moon um, excerpt um, to undercut its purported message. By doing so, it teaches the other women characters and the younger boy actor playing Bianca the kind of sister figure to Catherine in the play, and the junior boy actor who's performing alongside the senior boy actor who's playing Catherine, how to perform the woman's part. And what consequences that would have had for an audience in Kings Lynn or elsewhere on the, the tour of 1592-3, who knows? Catherine's role is the first example, uh, in that first example, illustrates something very striking about all the Shakespeare plays attributed to Pembroke's company. The Taming of the Shrew, Henry VI Parts 2 II and 3, and Titus Andronicus. They all have powerful roles for boy actors. Even early in his career then, Shakespeare, like the Lord in Taming of the Shrew, has complete confidence in those younger male performers to usurp the grace, voice and gait and action of a gentlewoman. And such confidence was founded on the system of apprenticeship used by the theatre companies, which taught boy players how to master the woman's part. And so I'll explain briefly how this worked. 
Acting, as we've heard from Richard earlier on, is a very dissolute trade. Um, it wasn't formally recognised as a profession, um, but it did have, and so it didn't have a formal sort of system of apprenticeship, unlike the other trades of carpenters, weavers, grocers, blacksmiths in early modern England. But senior members of the companies, who were also members of trade guilds, like John Hemmings, a master of the grocer's company, could bind boys as apprentices, whereby a boy lived at his master's house for a term of seven years, learning a trade. In the case of boy actors, this allowed apprentices to rehearse the women's parts opposite their masters. And Scott Macmillan has done a very good essay on this. Um, so the, the actors like Burbage, who um, took on um, apprentices, could then rehearse with the male leads. The extant guild records, ably analysed by David Cathman, Peter Blaney, David Mateer, have allowed theatre historians like Scott Macmillan, John Astington, Stanley Wells, Andrew Gurr and Richard Dutton to sketch a little bit more about the working lives of the boy actors as members of the company. What the records tell us has been the subject of quite lively academic debate, but it can be summarised in, in three basic points, I think. Firstly, although the laws suggest that boys didn't begin seven-year apprenticeships until late in their teenage years, many of the cases on record, including those where um, apprentices are bound to professional actors, suggest that 14 years seems to have been the most common age of the binding practice, meaning that an apprentice um, had an opportunity to learn and to hone the acting, uh, the acting skills of the woman's part until they were youths up to the age of 21. And another of the texts that you've got on the handout um, suggests a distinction between youths and boys, which is quite important in um, distinguishing those actors that are right on the verge of moving into manhood and maybe taking on the, the, lead, the male parts later on. Secondly, only 41% of apprentices across all trades trained for the full seven years. In practice, apprenticeship was a very flexible arrangement. Apprentices were typically recruited for their immediate abilities, so they were thrust straight into the job um, and they might finish by mutual agreement before the seven years were up. In Shakespeare's company, John Hemming's apprentices, Thomas Belt, who was from Norwich, George Burge, Thomas Holcomb, Robert Pallant, William Patrick and John, and John Lowen's apprentices, Thomas Jeffrey and George Vernon, were all bound, but they didn't formally complete their terms of apprentices of apprenticeship by becoming freemen. If a boy's qualifications for playing the woman's part were limited to his youthful physical characteristics, then the maturing process would encourage an early departure. So if he didn't become a good actor um, in the first few years and he just looked like a woman, then he could be, the, the, the uh, apprenticeship could finish. In addition to this, some boy actors were recruited and retained on a yearly basis as covenant servants rather than apprentices, as David Mateer has shown. And contracts of that type would have given an adult actor the opportunity to test out the acting abilities of boys on a flexible basis. In Shakespeare's company, it seems that contracts of indentured service existed between John Hemmings and his boy, John Rice, who turned out to be a very good bet, and between Augustine Phillips and Christopher Beeston, also good bets, as John Astington shows. Um, they referred to each other, respectively, as my servant and master, right the way through the terms, even though they became shareholders in Shakespeare's company. The flexibility of apprenticeship and, the, and of the contracts of, contra of indentured service meant that a relatively short stay in the company could happen for many boy actors whose coaches would quickly turn into pumpkins and they could no longer play the woman's part. 
and Gina Bloom, Dimna Callaghan and Carla Mazzio have all cited voice as the breaking point, literally, for boy actors. Hamlet tells the boy that he addresses as my young lady and mistress, pray God your voice like a piece of uncurrent gold be not cracked within the ring. The coming of age experienced by boy actors exists, I believe, as a subtext of Shakespeare's plays that would have been palpably obvious in early modern performances. The scripts deploy uh, a series of theatrical in-jokes about the point at which young actors cross the threshold into the freedom of a trade or to adult male roles. And many of these focus on voice. In Twelfth Night, for instance, this is number three on your handout, the threshold position occupied by the mature boy actor is played out in the female character, Viola, cross-dressing in imitation of her brother, Sebastian. So she's already playing the man's part, even though she's playing a woman, or he's playing a, a woman. Um, so um, Cesario um, is the, the cross-dressed character's name, and Cesario is referred to as both youth, 24 times in the play, and as boy, 12 times in the play. And the latter term is always used by older male characters referring back, almost as though it's a master talking back to a boy. We hear from Malvolio that Cesario is, quote, not yet old enough for a man, nor young enough for a boy. He is, quote, standing water between boy and man. And that tidal metaphor, very appropriate for Kings Lynn, is telling, I think. In Twelfth Night, we have um, a, a kind of tragic irony. Just as the mature boy or youth has reached the height of his skill in playing a woman's part, his physical ability to do so is slipping away. And that paradox is elaborated in the song, O Mistress Mine, which is attributed to Festy, played by Armin, probably, in the printed text. It becomes even more poignant if, as Tiffany Stern has suggested, that the song was originally written for the boy playing Viola Cesario, who promises at the beginning of the play to speak to Orsino in many kinds of music. But that boy actor can no longer do so, due to a broken voice. The song promises a lover who can sing both high and low, and it concludes with a carpe diem, seize the day motif. In delay there lies no plenty, then come and kiss me, sweet and twenty, youth's a stuff will not endure. In the light of David Kathman's argument that women's parts, even the longest and the most complex ones, were played by adolescent boys, no younger than 12 and no older than 21, that song's appeal to a master mistress figure, come, kiss, come and kiss me sweet and 20, and its recognition that youths of stuff will not endure, are highly resonant from the boy actor's point of view. Like all apprentices whose performances reach their peak as youths, the actor knows that performances as women, their performances of women, are like flowers which, once displayed, doth fall that very hour and, quote, die even when they to perfection grow. For youths who became really accomplished at playing over the years of their apprenticeships and took those demanding roles like Rosalind or Cleopatra or Lady Macbeth, the theatre companies provided a way forward and I believe Shakespeare wrote specifically to uh, retain them. Actors like Richard Sharp, who played Webster's Duchess of Malfi, for example, relinquished these male role leads to play male roles, often becoming sharers in the company. David Kathman notes the examples of Alexander Goff and John Honeyman, who graduated from playing women's parts to male roles for the King's Men. Goff continuing to play women's roles until he was at least 18. For these actors, 
Bidding good night to the woman's part, which they had worked so hard to perfect, must have been a real sea change of skills. Even if they were eager to do so, like Thisbe, uh, flute the bellows mender as Thisbe in Midsummer Night's Dream. As a consummately professional theatre practitioner, Shakespeare wrote female parts so that specifically prepared youths to enter the undiscovered country of adult male roles. Queen Margaret, in the two Pembroke plays, Henry VI Part Two and Part Three, is a case in point, I'm going to argue. If we assume, as most critics do, that these two plays were written before Henry VI Part One, then we can trace a pattern of growth through the scripts for the young actor who played the female lead of Queen Margaret. She starts off as an object in dis on display in the opening scene of Part Two, speaking only six and a half lines to her husband, her new husband, Henry VI, with perfectly feminine restraint. This is quoted on your handout. The excess of love I bear unto your grace forbids me to be lavish of my tongue, lest I should speak more than becomes a woman. She claims that all her happiness lies in pleasing him, and he praises her grace in speech. As the audience soon discover, however, this is all lies. She already has a lover, the Earl of Suffolk, and when she next speaks to him, it is far from submissive. She complains about the English nobles, especially the Duke and Duchess of Gloucester, protesting, am I a queen in title and in style and must be made subject to a duke? She plots with Suffolk against them. The ambitious Duchess of Gloucester, by the way, is the second boy part, is a kind of prototype for Lady Macbeth with fewer lines for, than Queen Margaret. Uh, but um, ha does have a showcase speech of about 31 lines, so it's a suitable training role for a, a junior boy actor who then watches and learns from the youth playing Margaret in the play. Henry VI Part Two stretches that youthful actor playing Queen Margaret emotionally and dramatically um, and oratorically by having him play the lover's part as well as a scheming Machiavellian queen. She persuades King Henry to depose Gloucester um, as the Lord Protector in a speech of 38 lines long that consolidates her political voice. Um, reprove my allegation if you can, she says, or else conclude my words effectual. The words are highly effectual. They're good training for a role like Antony in Julius Caesar. And having placed Gloucester's murder right in the mind of, of uh, sorry, having, having sort of placed that idea that Gloucester has to be deposed into Henry, she then plots Gloucester's murder um, and she then distracts Henry VI the grief for his uncle and his suspicions about uh, Gloucester's death by playing a, a, an elaborate tragic narrative, um, playing the role of a tragic neglected lover, claiming that Henry loved Gloucester better than he loved her. And she launches into a 50-line epic narrative that describes her journey to England. The pretty vaulting sea refused to drown me, knowing that thou wouldst have me drowned on shore, with salt tears as salt as sea through thy unkindness. The splitting rocks cowered on the sinking sands and would not dash me with their ragged sides, because thy flinty heart more hard than they, might in thy palace perish Margaret. So she makes him feel really guilty. <laughs> Margaret writes herself as a tragic heroine. She draws on classical illusion and probably on Marlowe's play Dido, Queen of Carthage, published in, in 1594, to compare herself to Dido. Henry is, gets compared to the faithless Aeneas, and Margaret concludes melodramatically, die, Margaret, for Henry weeps that thou dost live so long. 
And in case Henry should miss the point after these 50, you know, during these 50 lines, the heart-rending experience that she's supposedly um, feeling is made literal in a duel. She, she has this duel, and you've got the quote, long quotation, I'm not going to read it all out, but it's a heart that is bound in diamonds, and she rips it from her neck, and she casts it into the sea in the hopes that it's going to reach England. That diamond-hard object reminds off-stage spectators and readers that Margaret's epic is an empty fiction to deceive Henry, while her living heart beats for Suffolk, her lover. The banishment and death of Suffolk, later in the play, effectively widows Margaret and asks more from the boy actor emotionally. Stylistically, the character matures, her verse becomes less schematic, her metaphors become more organic, words are accompanied by physical gestures as she strives to wash his hand with her tears and to imprint his palm as though it were a letter with a kiss. That thou might think upon these lips by the seal through whom a thousand sighs are breathed for thee. That suspended moment of painful separation when she looks at him as one that surfeits thinking on a want is amplified by verbal antithesis. Even now be gone, oh no, not yet, yet now farewell and farewell life with thee. As their bodies embrace and part, Margaret's condensed phrases testify that this is loving in truth and fain in verse her love to show. After that bravura performance in Act 3, Scene 2, Margaret has very little to say until the final scene, Shakespeare perhaps not taxing the boy actor beyond his limits. In Henry VI, Part 3, however, Margaret reta retains um, uh, uh, an emphasis throughout the whole text. She becomes the effective head of state. She impatiently chastises Henry in the opening scene um, and commands the Lancastrian forces through the Wars of the Roses with the Yorkists. Her address to the troops at Tewkesbury in Act 5, Scene 4, reworks her earlier sea narrative. She adopts the trope of the ship again, but this time it's the ship of state. And she peoples it with members of the Lancastrian army to unite them to fight against the Yorkists. And what is Edward but a ruthless sea? That's Edward of York. What Clarence but a quicksand of deceit? And Richard but a ragged fatal rock? Such, such strategic rhetoric is good training for adult male roles like Richmond in Richard III, O'Mell in Richard II, or Prince John in 2 Henry IV, or further down the line even leads like Henry V. Margaret's own son, Prince Henry, calls her a woman of valiant spirit, and another way in which the boy actor gets educated is in mourning his loss in the play, perhaps a preparation for the role of Constance, a, a bigger female role, well, not a bigger female role, but a significant female role in King John. Women, uh, but most famous, perhaps, is York's exclamation, O oh, tiger's heart wrapped in a woman's hide. Women are soft, mild, pitiful, and flexible. Thou, stern, obdurate, flinty, rough, remorseless. The youth playing Margaret has become a man in woman's clothing, an Alphidius from Coriolanus, or a Caesar in the making to Richard Burbage's Coriolanus or Antony. Who might have played these parts in a tour by Pembroke's men to Norfolk and perhaps to King Lynn? An invaluable document, um, a plot, um, an outline of where the actors stood um, in the theatre and when they needed to come on stage to a play called The, the Seven Deadly Sins, part two, analysed by David Kathman and most recently by Richard Dutton, gives us a snapshot of the Lord Chamberlain's company in 1597 and suggests that these possible, uh, the several possible candidates for this earlier performance. It lists members of the company, though not 
John Hemmings, Will Kemp or Shakespeare and what roles they're to play. And it's remarkable for including at least four boy players who went on to adult careers within the company. Two of these youths, Christopher Beeston and Henry Condell, have already passed the threshold um, and are cast in substantial male roles in The Seven Deadly Sins. Beeston appears as a soldier and a captain to Prince Ferrix, and Henry Condell is Prince Ferrix himself. He's playing opposite an adult male actor as his brother playing the role of Porrex, and he also plays a lord. The boy, Alexander Cook, apprentice to Burbage, is cast as the lead female uh, roles, Queen Videna and Procne, um, the wife of Terius in the Seven Deadly Sins plot. So that actor, um, Alexander Cook, wouldn't have been mature enough to play the female leads in 1593. Now, since, as we've heard, there was so much uh, fluid movement between companies, plays and players before 1594, and arguably even afterwards, it's impossible to say who played the women's parts. Queen Margaret and the Duchess of Gloucester, or Lady Boner in Henry VI, Part Three, <coughs> Caterina and her sister Bianca in Taming of the Shrew, um, Tamara and Lavinia in Titus Andronicus. We don't know. Indeed, Holger Schmidt Schott Syme has actually argued that the first Henriad died with Pembroke's men as a work of live theatre and was never staged by the Chamberlain's men or the King's men. Nevertheless, when Hemmings and Condal collected Shakespeare's works together for publication in the first folio of 1623, they included all three parts of Henry VI and list they listed the names of the principal actors in all these plays. So memories of those performances, I think, lived on. And I'd like to end by speculating that the actor most likely candidates uh, for playing the women's parts in that strange Pembroke's tour and possibly Norfolk performances of 1592 are Christopher Beeston and the man to whom Shakespeare bequeathed money for a mourning ring in his own will, Henry Condell. Henry Condell was born in Norwich on the 5th of September 1576 and he maintained connections with Norfolk once he was in London. David Cathman, with the help of Alan Nelson and William Ingram, has established uh, Condal's links to a family network with property in London and Norfolk, from which, uh, with the help of David, who, who did the family tree for me, I've constructed a family tree on the back of the, the handout. Condal wasn't apprenticed or indentured to a member of the theatre company, but in 1591, when he was aged 15, his father died, and he probably moved to stay with his maternal uncles, Humphrey Yeomans, uh, a wealthy blacksmith who had um, inherited a quarter of his brother William Yeomans' um, pr uh, property in London um, when William Yeomans died in 1589 with no children. There were three other inheritors. Um, there were um, William's three sisters, Sir Henry Condell's mother, Joan, and his aunts Anne Gilda and Alice Gurney, who were married and who lived in Norfolk, near Norwich. The Yeomans blacksmiths and residences were at St Bride's in Fleet Street, and the records describe Humphrey Yeoman's house as a tavern called the Queen's Head. These family pre premises, which you can see on the map, that you were given, the Agus map, um, were close to um, an, another inn, the Bell Savage Inn, which was a performance space. So, and it was also close to the Inns of Court. So as you can see from that map, it offered plenty of opportunity for Condal to meet those from the theatre. Perhaps he served unofficially with his uncle Humphrey, um, as metal workers were uh, permitted to take up to three apprentices. When Yeoman, uh, Humphrey died in 1594 with an infant son, and after Condal married in 1596, he seems to have been in a position to expand. And he began then um, at the death of his, his mother in 1603. He bought more and more of the Yeoman's property from his Gilda and Gurney cousins, as well as becoming a shareholder in the Globe and later in the Blackfriars Theatre. 
Aged 17 in 1593, with strong Norfolk connections, he would have been the perfect age to take on roles like Catherine or Queen Margaret in tours by Pembroke's men or Stage's men. By 1597, at 21, he'd surrendered the woman's part and had taken on a um, princely role in The Seven Deadly Sins. But maybe we can just glimpse his transition in the 1595 plays Romeo and Juliet, Midsummer Night's Dream, and possibly King John. Perhaps one of the young lovers in Midsummer Night's Dream, looking back to his apprenticeship in the years of the comic, the, the, the comic figure of flute, the bellows mender, bellowing hot air on the stage instead of working in the blacksmiths, perhaps. One tiny detail I want to end with, and I really don't know, I've only just found this out, so would be most really, uh, you know, uh, keen to hear what you think. One detail that suggests that Connell might have stepped onto the stage um, as a man early on in his career, I think might have been the bastard in King John. After the bastard has accepted his identity as the illegitimate son of Richard Lionheart, rather than the land of his father, his mother comes into the court accompanied by a servant, and uniquely in Shakespeare, this character is cued and then greeted in the text by his full name, as you can see from an image uh, from the first folio text, which is on the handout. So we get, enter Lady Falconbridge and James Gurney. And later on in the text, Philip the Bastard says, James Gurney, will thou give us leave a while? James Gurney, good leave, good Philip. Philip Sparrow, James. James, there's toys abroad. Alon, I'll tell thee more. Now, editors and critics have commented on the remarkable familiarity between the newly knighted royal bastard and this mysterious figure of James Gurney. What if he was the spear carrier who was just brought on at the last minute? Honigman noted that the formula good, 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 good leave, good Philip, was only used between equals. But if Henry Condal were playing the bastard in court, then James Gurney from the country would be a cousin. The only other Gurneys mentioned are a Sir Hugh Gurney in early modern records who accompanied William the Conqueror and the Thomas Gurney who is a guard at Berkeley Castle in Marlowe's Edward II, also a Pembroke's men's play. That is wild speculation. We don't know. Um, but it is tempting to think that the actor born in Norwich would have been addressed um, and the, the man who kind of addressed th those lines was the man that Shakespeare left money to uh, buy a ring for his mourning. Maybe that was the same man that played his first queen, maybe to or with in or in his Henry VI 23 years earlier. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alison. Yet another Kingsley connection with Mr. Condal. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much. Now, finally, Dr. Peter Smith. Let me tell you something about Peter. Peter Smith is reader in Renaissance. Oh, hang on. Well, let's let's see. Let's see where everybody's going now. It's nothing personal, Pete. Hurry up, please. Start again. Peter Smith is reader in Renaissance literature at Nottingham Trent University. He is the author of Social Shakespeare, Aspects of Renaissance Dram Dramaturgy and Contemporary Society and Between Two Schools, Scatology, Scatology and the Representations in English Literature, Chaucer to Swift. He is co-editor of Hamlet, Theory and in Practice and Much Ado About Nothing. A critical reader. His essays and reviews have appeared in, in, in sorry, I'm losing my sight here, Cahiers, Cahiers? Thank you. Elizabe Elizabethan's Critical Survey, Renaissance Quarterly, Shakespeare, Shakespeare Bulletin, Shakespeare Survey, Times Higher Education, 
and years work in English studies. He is co-editor-in-chief co of Cahaya's Elizabethans and a former trustee of the British Shakespeare Association. Peter's talk is entitled Rude Wind, King Lear, Canonicity versus Physicality. This is what he says. Too often, readers of King Lear, both critical and theatrical, abstract the play's greatness and champion its transcendental genius. In the teeth of this orthodoxy, I propose that we should confront the canonical centrality of Shakespeare's Shakespeare's putatively greatest play with an awareness of its physicality, a human body tortured and even decaying. Wonderful. Such an approach seems at first sight to be both perverse and iconoclastic, but it will reveal a way of exploring the play's insistent materiality and in so doing demonstrate the fallacy of readings which champion its metaphysical, philosophical or even theological status. Moreover, a reading that turns its attention to the wastefulness of the text may helpfully lead us away from the abstractions of theoretical approaches which, not in too frequently, sanitize, airbrush, or euphemize the deprivations which feature so prominently at the heart of the devastating and devastated play. King's Lear, King Lear's interest in bodily processes is not for the squeamish, but a recognition of the play's obsession with bodies, their stink and their dirt, actors and characters, gets us closer to the lived experience of Shakespeare's theatre. Don't like what you say about actors there. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Peter Smith. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for your hospitality. Thank you to Tony and Lizzie for putting us up while we're here. Very grateful for that. Lovely to be in Kings Lynn. Uh, scary to go on after four such excellent papers, and particularly scary since my former professor, Richard Dutton, is in the audience, so needless to say, any errors that remain are entirely his fault. Uh, <laughs> I'll start with a brief introduction and then move on to King Lear. The picture I want us to start with is the one on the front of the handout, which is a fella sitting on the toilet. So this picture shows us the surgery of Dr. Panurgus, a young, well-dressed aristocrat in slashed doublet, earring, swords and spurs, lies on a low table, his head entering a furnace in order to purge the gallant's brain. Floating up from the chimney above him is a catalogue of contemporary iniquities, these airy castles. Tennis, drinking, smoking, bear baiting, fencing, playing backgammon and cards, presumably for money, gambling at dice, hunting with dogs, and so on. A bare breasted courtesan, and the comic and tragic masks represent the evils of the flesh and the theatre, while an acrobatic descent on a rope from the tower of the pre fire St. Paul's symbolises the perils of treating religion as a plaything. The many objects indicate the level of the young rake's epicurean indulgence. The engraving's top right-hand corner offers an explanation of the image as a whole. To this grave doctor, millions do resort, both from the country, city and the court. Whence, though they come as thick as rain can fall, such is his skill that he can cure them all. For by his waters, drugs, conserves and potions, he purgeth fancies, follies, idle motions. Note that the OED offers a definition of motion, citing Shakespeare's Merry Wives of Windsor, the involuntary action of the intestines leading to discharge of their contents and evacuation of the bowels, also chiefly in plural, as in this instance, that which is evacuated, the faeces. The significance of this bodily term is to suggest that social and political purges are at least as reliant upon physical as mental therapies. 
When Macbeth discusses his ruined realm with the doctor, he insists on the connection between political and intestinal and urinary well-being. If thou couldst, doctor, cast the water of my land, find her disease and purge it to a sound and pristine health. Three lines later, he talks of voiding the English invaders as though Scotland were excreting them. What rhubarb, syme, or what purgative drug would scour these English hence? The engraving insists on the purgation of vice from country, court, and city across all social classes, but it also insists that purific the purification is not merely mental or psychological. In fact, the most striking section of the picture demonstrates that purgation is ineluctably physical. Stage right is dominated by a character who could have stepped straight out of Ben Jonson's The Alchemist. Dressed in imposing robes, the doctor administers to the mouth of a rude rustical, a laxative made up of wisdom's force and understanding, a dose of such potency that the patient is already perched on a close stool, his hose around his knees, and in the process of excreting a curious diversity of faecal matter. The goose, fool, woodcock, buzzard, calf, and ass. The quack's name, Dr. Panergus, is engraved on the dresser on either side of his hat. The print is complicated, not least by the plenitude of annotation, thought bubbles, names of ingredients, continency, discretion, and so on, and what appears to be a satire on the burdensome debates of religious difference, hence the two clerics in the square frame downstage centre, each stooping under the weight of the churches that they're supporting. But the naming of the doctor offers a clue as to how to read the image as a whole. Dr. Panergus is clearly inspired by Rabelais' Gargantua and Pantagruel, not Englished by Sir Thomas Urquhart until 1653, but already well known enough to figure in As You Like It when Celia talks of borrowing Gargantua's mouth. By the 1620s, and this engraving is usually dated to 1621, Rabelais was well known in England and personified ideas of scatological comedy in the same way that Machiavelli was a watchword for political cunning. This comedic discourse was invigorated by another to do with bodily health. Essentially Galenic in origin, the Renaissance body was kept in order by the correct balance of four humours. Phlebotomy and purging were the order of the day, designed to keep the bodily fluids in kilter. Laxatives, purges, clysters, enemas, carminatives and emetics were designed to cleanse the body of unwelcome influences. Similarly, bodily effluent could be taken to the wise woman or the doctor to aid diagnosis, as we've just seen is the case in Macbeth's request to his doctor regarding Scotland's political health. There's a plenitude of medieval and early modern medieval track, uh, medical tracts which demonstrate the psychological and humoral significance of faecal matter. But for now, the image of Dr. Panergus is important to what follows in its association with the two poles of my title, canonicity on the one hand and physicality on the other. Stage left, sandwiched between the curve of the brick furnace and the writing beneath, is the engraver's signature. It's very small on the reproduction, just at the bottom of the furnace, right at the bottom of the engraving. It reads M.D. Sculpsit. The monogram is the abbreviated form of Martin Drershout Sculpsit London, which you'll find on the next page of the handout. And that signature, as you know, appears at the bottom of the most iconographic engraving in English, perhaps world literature, on the next page. That is, Martin Drershout is the engraver of a defecating rustic, his hose pulled down and weird effluent pouring from his bowels. But Martin Drershout is also the engraver of the head of Shakespeare that appears as the frontispiece of the first folio. The engraver of this bizarre scatological satire is the same as that of the most canonical image of our greatest dramatist, a fact that, as far as, far as I'm aware, has never been remarked on before. For my purposes, the fact that Drershout is the engraver of both images is enormously significant. When Hemming and Condell commissioned the engraving for the frontispiece of F1, would they not have been worried that the portrait of their beloved and gentle playwright might be tainted by the scatological comedy of the artist's faecal engraving, which had appeared just two years earlier? 
Were they ignorant of the existence of Dr. Panurgus? Or might it be that the squeamishness that we feel nowadays towards matters scatological is a relatively recent historical phenomenon? I've argued in between two stools that there are two broadly distinctive attitudes towards scatological writing. The first is carnivalesque, merry, even hearty, typified in the writings of Chaucer and Shakespeare. The second is self-disgust, an attitude characterised by the withering misanthropy and hypochondria. Will Stockton sums up this seismic shift in sensibility, writing that Theses loses its carnivalesque association with renewal and rebirth throughout the 16th and 17th centuries. As evidence of this, Keith Thomas notes how conduct books of the earlier period included advice about passing wind, but that this disappears following the Restoration. By the last quarter of the 17th century, he writes, the fart had begun its journey from the realm of the comic and the embarrassing to the new category of the sordid and the unmentionable. The key figure, I argue, in this transition is John Wilmot, Earl of Rochester, discussion of which we'll have to wait for another if I ever get asked back to King's Lynn. <laughs> but, we might note, but we might note in passing here the connection between Rochester's satire upon nothing and Lear's axiomatic, nothing will come of nothing. Central here is to acknowledge that, in the 1620s at least, the same artist could engrave the portrait of a man who's become the world's most influential playwright at almost the same time that he was engraving the image of a cerebral and graphically intestinal purge. In the work of Dreschout, we find that combination of high and low culture that runs canonical and carnivalesque together. Sanctioned and civilised artefacts, the first folio portrait, and scatological humour in Dr. Panurgus coexist in the oeuvre of the same artist, evidence of the culture's aptitude now lost to occupy a position between two stools. The quotation, Rude Wind, comes from the meeting of Albany and Goneril in Act Four of King Lear. She remarks that she's been worth the whistling. Registering her iniquity, he adopts her adage and both inflates it and poisons it. Oh, Goneril, you're not worth the dust which the rude wind blows in your face. Wind is associated with rudeness, rudeness in the sense of harsh, stormy, destructive, but also in the sense of unmannerly, or as OED has it, offensively or deliberately discourteous. King Lear's wind, here and elsewhere, is rude, in the sense that traditions of low comedy are rude, Bactinian Billingsgate terms are rude, schoolboy humour, seaside postcards and fart jokes are rude. In what follows, I propose that we should confront the canonical centrality of Shakespeare's greatest play with an awareness of its physicality, its attentions to the body and even scatology. This approach seems at first sight to be iconoclastic, upending this greatest of Shakespeare's works. But I'm going to insist that actually if we pay attention to these aspects of the play, we get a much closer reading to that that Shakespeare's contemporaries may have experienced than that which criticism, the direction in which criticism has taken the play in the last 400 years. It's risking turning King Lear into carry on Shakespeare <laughs> to point out that it contains one of the most elemental fart jokes in the whole of Inglit, blow winds and crack your cheeks. But it may well be that such flatulent readings serve to complicate what are by now almost jaded assumptions about the play's transcendent greatness. One small example. Note that Albany's contemptuous salutation mentions dust. Chaucer the Pilgrim's tale is as dry as dust, and Harry Bailey interrupts him, thy drasty rhyming is not worth a turd. Drast, meaning crap, and dust are frequently mixed in the Renaissance and right up through the 19th century and, um, before the invention of domestic sewerage systems. As late as 1865, Mr. Boffin, in Dickens's Our Mutual Friend, is euphemistically collecting dust, that is the mixture of ashes from fireplaces and horse dung, which was used in the manufacture of bricks and road surfaces. Thomas Burra insists that Ben Jonson, as an apprentice bricklayer, would have come into close contact with manure on a regular basis. 
and Kent's violent outburst in King Lear associates plastering with the lavatorial as he threatens to tread this unbolted villain, Oswald, into mortar and daub the wall of a Jake's, that is a toilet, with him. Later in the same scene, the Ajax, Ajax pun reappears. None of these rogues and cowards but Ajax is their fool. Thus, not only is Albany's dust probably faecal, but its destination is Goneril's face. Could it be that behind this throwaway detail lurks the notorious flatulence of Chaucer's Miller's Tale, the thunder-dent fart of Nicholas, the thunderclap fart of Nicholas, who lets one fly full into the face of the squeamish Absalom? Shakespeare's Troilus and Cressida draws its plot and character from Chaucer's narrative poem, while the prologue of Two Noble Kinsmen pays tribute to Chaucer of All Admired. The source of Shakespeare and Fletcher's play was The Knight's Tale. Is it such a stretch to imagine Shakespeare reading that of the Miller, which immediately follows? But before ruining King Lear for you by irreparably associating its magisterial substance with whoopee cushion puerility, we must first acknowledge its supreme canonical reputation. In Dr. Johnson's opinion, the tragedy of Lear is deservedly celebrated among the dramas of Shakespeare. There is perhaps no play which keeps the attention so strongly fixed, which so much agitates our passions and interests our curiosity. So powerful is the current of the poet's imagination that the mind which once ventures within it is hurried irresistibly along. Nearer our own time, A.C. Bradley, the greatness of King Lear, in his opinion, is indisputable. King Lear has again and again been described as Shakespeare's greatest work, the best of his plays, the tragedy in which he exhibits most fully his multitudinous powers. And if we were doomed to lose all his dramas except one, probably the majority of those who know and appreciate him best would pronounce for keeping King Lear. Published over a century ago, this opinion has enjoyed a long life and has hardened into something of a critical orthodoxy. Even the usually sceptical Jan Cott finds King Lear superior to other plays. King Lear, he writes, is still recognised as a masterpiece, beside which even Macbeth and Hamlet seem tame and pedestrian. King Lear is compared to Bach's Mass in B minor, to Beethoven's Fifth and Ninth Symphonies, to Wagner's Parsifal, Michelangelo's Last Supper, and Dante's Purgatory and Inferno. The same Dantesque comparison was made by Barbara Everett, who insisted on the eminence of the play. King Lear, she writes, is our greatest tragedy, a divine comedy of the modern world. What could be more iconoclastic then than to attack this play? The mischievously controversial critic Terry Hawkes, who once told The Guardian that he'd rather watch the bill on TV than go out and see Shakespeare, knew exactly what he was doing when he attacked the reputation of Shakespeare's masterpiece. Almost a quarter of a century ago, in an interview in The Guardian, he and James Wood, the paper's chief literary critic, had an argument about the greatness of Shakespeare. They took as their starting point, Hawkes' recently published book on King Lear, in which we might have expected him to say something laudatory about the play. He doesn't. James Wood. Professor Hawkes, in your new book, King Lear, you say that there's been much dispute over the years about whether King Lear is a masterpiece, and that the logical extension of your position is that it may very well not be. But wouldn't you agree that even if we can't know if Lear is a masterpiece, the fact that we go back to it again and again suggests in itself some value, to which Hawkes responds, but I want to know who goes back to it and in what circumstances. Most people don't go home and take King Lear off the shelves, they watch TV. What directs people back to King Lear, by and large, is an education system which insists on having English at the core of its humanities program and Shakespeare at the core of English. This exchange typifies Hawkes' own version of the politics of literature and his scepticism towards the institutions which promote the circulation of high culture. Matt this morning was talking about the pedestal effect of Shakespeare, very much what Hawkes is on about here. Hawkes insists on the necessity of literature's political intervention in the status quo. He says, I don't want to say these texts are great because I want to allow historicism its full play. I believe in change in societies, and the idea that certain texts are the products of genius freezes change because it appeals to a notion of transcendent value. I don't believe in that. 
It's significant that Hawke's attempts to politicise King Lear because while Hamlet's reception dwelt on the political corruption of Elsinore and identified the prince not merely as a revenger but as a political scourge, King Lear was often read as a retreat from politics. Hawke's trademark mock truculence, insists on the material conditions of the play's consumption, in the theatre or the classroom. Underlined by its canonical centrality, King Lear is infused with a kind of cultural capital, which precludes, argues Hawkes, any challenge to its continued circulation. In his review of Thomas Burroughs' The Fury of Men's Gullets, Ben Jonson and the Digestive Canal, published in 1998, Hawkes's concern with the scatological appears to justify this demand for a more material analysis of the play, although he rightly points out that scatological or carnivalesque readings of canonical drama may, he writes, be distasteful to a culture which still peers at the early modern period through Victorian spectacles. Hawkes says, nevertheless, it raises a central issue in respect of the public theatres and their dramatists in a community over which Ordia held sway. <laughs> London not only stank to high heaven as a result of its enormous problems of waste disposal, but the popular entertainments with which the theatres competed almost made a feature of confronting, involving, and to some extent splattering their audience with blood, guts, and general filth. He's talking about the bear baiting of course, that took place in places like the Hope. Hawkes goes on to argue that the separation of theatre on the one hand and bear baiting on the other, with its savagery, spittle, blood, guts and feces, would certainly not have made sense to the average member of an early modern audience. Indeed, he goes on, such spaces as the Hope doubled as both arenas for bear baiting and theatrical entertainments. Hawkes is concerned that sanitised Victorian readings of Johnson's plays too readily gloss over their rude materiality. He writes, Johnson's interest in bodily functions, his unrelenting pursuit of the links between the alimentary and the literary, his preoccupation with eating, evacuation, vomiting, and the all too human stench that these disseminate, are less shortcomings in need of explanation than dimensions of an art whose true contours we still fail accurately to discern. Centrally here, Hawkes's insistence on the scatological materiality outweighs Burra's reliance upon anthropological theory. From its beginnings, scatological criticism has been characterised by a wide variety of analytical approaches. Norbert Elias and David Inglis address the development of the modern fecal habitus in sociological terms, while Norman Brown discusses the excremental vision in terms of psychoanalysis, and Mary Douglas dealt with the anthropology of dirt. Rose George's The Big Necessity, Adventures in the World of Human Waste, explores sewage disposal and public hygiene from the point of view of sustainability and environmentalism which is, of course, particularly appropriate nowadays, but was anticipated by the World War II Quaker and pacifist Reginald Reynolds. John Bork describes various fecal rituals as long ago as 1891 in his encyclopedic Scatologic Rites of All Nations. In literary studies, of course, Peter Stalabras and Alan White's The Politics and Poetics of Transgression read scatological and sociological taboos in cultural materialist terms. And Gail Kern Pastor's The Body Embarrassed is also an exemplification of that. Recent developments in waste studies are defiantly materialistic, as a brief survey of the field over the last decade or so will illustrate. Russ Ganim and Jeff Purcell's are Scatology's New Wave Pioneers. In 2004, their Fecal Matters in Early Modern Literature and Art argued that while sexuality, quote, has long been the darling of academic readers, scatology still retains the power to make us blush, to provoke shame and embarrassment. They go on, on, they go on, the contributors to this volume address unflinchingly the objective reality of the scatological as part and parcel of material culture. Three years later, Valerie Allen's book on farting, language and laughter in the Middle Ages, analyzed the systems of belief surrounding the complicated exegetic traditions, leading to the variety of explanations of involuntary farting as found in the commentaries of Augustine and the classical medicine of Hippocrates and Galen. 
Anal eruptions, you'll be pleased to hear, testify to the post-lapsarian bodily disobedience, which we've inherited as a result of the fall, which incidentally is also a cause of involuntary erections. Sophie G's Making Waste, Leftovers in the 18th Century Imagination, examines the underside of a period more usually associated with the pioneering optics of Isaac Newton or the Lucient architecture of Christopher Wren, both of whom illuminated the Enlightenment. By contrast, G dwells rather on the period's, quote, waste matter, excrement, snot, sweat, nail clippings, garbage, and dead dogs. Martha Bayliss, in Sin and Filth in Medieval Culture, The Devil in the Latrine, argued that what in the modern world is trivial, embarrassing, taboo, or merely a topic of puerile humour, was in the pre and early modern world, not simply the emblem for, but, quote, the actual embodiment of the sin that made flesh impure and corrupt. As she puts it, excrement did not just mean sin, in medieval thought, it was sin, the material embodiment of the corporal corruptibility. Notice the reappearance of that word, embodiment. Bayliss's criticism is refreshingly materialistic and shares with a lot of recent work on scatology a bracing suspicion of the abstractions and obfuscations of more rarefied literary theory. In this she follows perhaps the most staunchly materialist of recent writers on scatology, another medievalist, Susan Morrison. Morrison's brilliant book, Excrement in Late, in Late Middle Ages, Sacred Filth and Chaucer's Fico Poetics, exemplifies the ethical dimension of such an approach. So there's a political dimension to this too, I think. There she argues that literary theory too frequently dematerializes the body and abstracts the physical inspiration of so much artistic endeavor. Corporeal experience is deodorized and its representation euphemized. She writes, material dirt itself demands investigation. She attacks particularly post-structuralist linguistics, feminism, and psychoanalysis, all of which have tended to theorize physical processes out of sight, and we might add smell. She writes, the recent critical debate about the history of the body has tended to avoid the topic of excrement. The stench of material flesh can be hidden by theoretical musings. In 2015, Morrison's The Literature of Waste was published, the logic of which is accumulative rather than analytic. It is in this amassing of material that the book demonstrates a salient feature that all of the above studies share, albeit articulated to differing degrees, a concern with the materiality of lived experience. And it's that aspect of King Lear that I want us to think about. An instance of this material focus can be seen in the work of Holly Dugan, for whom Hawkes' cocktail of the discharges of the Hope Theatre looms large. Dugan's approach is invigorated by what Morrison terms thingness, or embodiment. Of Johnson's Bartholomew Fair, Dugan writes, The play's many references to the scent of livestock, pork, leather, tobacco, stale gingerbread, ale, farts, belches, sweat and urine, conjure both the material realm of the fair and the stage. Like Smithfield Market, the Hope, located to the south on Bankside, had its own uniquely foul stench, connected to that of the surrounding area, the aroma of the pike stews, soap boiling yards, rose gardens, mud, and the flooded, polluted ditches of the surrounding area. But they were combined with the smells of the theatre, its structure, and its occupants, the sweat, urine, belches, perfume of the actors, animals, and crowd, along with the apples, oysters, ale, and tobacco that they undoubtedly consumed inside. These scents, to name just a few of them, defined the smellscape of the hope. These features often figure conspicuously in anti-theatrical accounts and descriptions of London and are, Dugan concludes, an important part of the understanding of the material conditions of London's theatrical entertainments. For Bruce Burra, it is Middleton, as well as Johnson, who captures vividly early modern London's rapid urbanization and environmental degradation. Civic immorality, in Middleton's work, is symbolized by Audia, he writes. Middleton is able to depict the city so successfully as a site of moral turpitude because he also views it as a place of excrement. In Johnson's, 
Johnson's fecal imagination is, it is, is, in contrast, burdened with urban detritus in shockingly material terms. From a jaundiced perspective, Burra writes, the devil is an ass is the story of London itself in little. The arrival of new goods, the growth of markets, the increase of desire and frenetic activity, all in the end reduced to sewage. The contents of a close stool, a shithouse, a prison. But while Johnson and Middleton are readily construed in these scatological ways, Shakespeare's canonical centrality tends to discourage such an approach. As Prince Hamlet remembers the nobility of his dead father, he notes how the king protected Gertrude from the buffeting heir, quite the opposite of Albany and Goneril. So loving to my mother that he might not, between the winds of heaven, visit her face too roughly. Shakespeare's transcendental canonicity shields his reader like Gertrude too frequently from the buffeting of the playwright's flatulent materiality. However, King Lear typifies Shakespeare's contempt for the abstract. Shakespeare is bluntly, most of the time rudely, concrete. And it is this concreteness or materiality, especially in terms of physicality, what Bayliss referred to as embodiment, to which we must now turn. Shakespeare's characters are continually validating what they say with what they organically are, habitually equating their speech with their bodies. At the beginning of Richard II, for example, Bolingbroke accuses Mowbray of lying. He threatens literally to make him eat his words with a foul traitor's name, stuff I thy throat, and asserts that what I speak, my body shall make good. At the opening of Macbeth, Duncan seizes upon the body's genuineness. Physicality validates speech. Addressing the bloody sergeant, he remarks, so well thy words become thee as thy wounds, they smack of honour both. The bloody sergeant himself is unable to speak further, but his body calls out for assistance. I cannot tell, but I am faint. My gashes cry for help. Similarly, in his supremely understated incitement to riot, Mark Antony disclaims his oratorical skills and relocates them in the gaping cuts of the body in front of him. Show you sweet Caesar's wounds, poor, poor, dumb mouths, and I bid them speak for me. But were I Brutus, and Brutus Antony, there were an Antony would ruffle up your spirits and put a tongue in every wound of Caesar that should move the stones of Rome to rise and mutiny. Previously, in the same play, Casca has quite literally vocalised his political aspirations through his destructive dexterity. Speak hands for me. Even the lowly third citizen in Coriolanus recognises the irresistible rhetorical force of wounds. He asserts that they are unable to deny Coriolanus their voices, for if he show us his wounds and tell us his deeds, we are to put our tongues into those wounds and speak for them. Edmund, in King Lear, realises the rhetorical importance of the wound. It is as if his false reports may be substantiated by corporeal evidence. Some blood drawn upon me would beget opinion of my more fierce endeavour. These wounds testify to dignity and even majesty, publicly displayed and heroic in stature. Of course, Edmunds are fraudulent because they're self-inflicted. In contrast to such ennobling damage, the body in King Lear is tested almost to destruction gross, stinking, and frail, and, as it is forced towards ruin, beshitten. Meeting Lear on the heath, Gloucester requests that he may kiss his sovereign's hand, and Lear responds, let me wipe it first, it smells of mortality. Although in Titus Andronicus we see the aftermath of Lavinia's rape, with her hands lopped off, her tongue cut out, her mouth issuing a fountain of blood, nowhere do we actually witness the procedures of physical torture in progress. Nowhere, that is, with the obscene exception of the blinding of Gloucester in King Lear. The attention the playwright pays to the physical devastation of Gloucester's eyes is unique. Out, vile jelly, where is thy luster now? With chilling irony, Shakespeare has Gloucester foresee his own punishment. As Regan interrogates him as to the reason he sent the king to Dover, Gloucester replies, because I would not see thy cruel nails pluck out his poor old eyes. It's at this point that the audience starts to flinch as we realise the torturous potential behind Goneril's earlier pluck out his eyes. 
What William Miller has called the blind world of Lear leads directly to a prurient fascination with stink and the reek of corruption. There's hell, there's darkness, there's the sulphurous pit, burning, scalding, stench, consumption. In King Lear's opening lines, the play's most wicked character has successfully, but only temporarily, deodorized. Of Edmund, Gloucester asks Kent, do you smell a fault? The incipient stench is there, albeit not yet manifest. As Miller puts it, the blind world of Lear is a world of hopelessness, randomness, moral chaos and despair. Only smell thrives, and that is why the atmosphere is so poisoned and depressingly frightening and filled with utter disgust with life. Like that of poor Tom, the body in King Lear is grimed with filth, fetid and fecal. The next picture on the handout is the is the, um, the hovel scene with poor Tom, as you can see, covered in mud and filth. As Carolyn Spurgeon argued a long time ago, the body, in, the body is the central image in King Lear, and yet it is an agonised body. In anguished movement, she writes, tugged, wrenched, beaten, pierced, stung, scourged, dislocated, flayed, gashed, scolded, tortured, and finally broken on the rack. Even the usually level-headed Albany threatens to dismember his wife, justifying his violence towards her in terms of his own sanguinary determinism. Weren't my fitness to let these hands obey my blood, they're apt to dislocate and tear thy flesh and bones. These moments illustrate, illustrate the centrality of King Lear's tortured body, the revelation of which the playwright stages most profoundly in Lear's tearing at his clothes in order to join poor Tom in his nakedness. Thou art the thing itself. An accommodated man is no more than a poor, bare, forked animal. David Hillman pronounces King Lear to be the most painfully corporealized play among Shakespeare's works. And during the play's most profound moments, in the final scene, Lear attempts again to expose that corporeality. Pray you, undo this button. There's no need for theoretical abstractions because Shakespeare cites his drama in the physicality of his scripts and the actors speaking them. The drama is concretized in front of us, in the flesh. Alexandra Harris insists on this physical certainty. Through all the spouting, cracking, spilling, washing in Shakespeare's plays, the human body proves stubbornly solid. Kent's role as a messenger intersects with that of Oswald, whom Kent tripped and humiliated only a few days earlier in the presence of the king, and his challenge is phrased in suitably carnal terms. Come, I'll flesh ye. Oswald reiterates this reference to human tissue when he describes the situation to Cornell as the fleshment of this dread exploit. It is as though the challenge has become incarnate. King Lear illustrates this idea of bodily truth. Edmund's realization of his political aspirations is intimately related to his physical attractiveness to the warring princesses. By choosing to sleep with one or the other, he's able to fashion his own political advancement. To both these sisters have I sworn my love, each jealous of the other as the stung are of the adder. Which one of them shall I take, both, one or neither? While Edmund's physical assertiveness and Edgar's physical privation offer two extremes of bodily politics, one with and one without authority, Lear's movement from the former to the latter demonstrates the play's prurient obsession with human tissue and its decay. Unlike in Hamlet, where the flesh is too, too solid, locking the prince's transcendent spirit within the nutshell prison of Denmark, in King Lear the flesh is mortified, decaying, rotting. Stephen Greenblatt talks about the way in which the play, in spite of its several mentions of Jove or Apollo, as well as the gods, is actually supremely naturalistic. There are no ghosts or witches, as there are in Richard III, Julius Caesar, Hamlet or Macbeth. Cordelia is not a spirit, and Lear's mistaking her for one is a symptom of his insanity. In the words of Greenblatt, King Lear is haunted by a sense of rituals and beliefs that are, no, that are no longer efficacious, that have been emptied out. The characters appeal again and again to the pagan gods, but the gods remain utterly silent. Nothing answers to human questions but human voices. Nothing breathes about the heart but human desires. Nothing inspires awe or terror but human suffering and human depravity. 
For all the invocation of the gods in King Lear, it is clear that there are no devils. Greenblatt is talking here about the competing religious positions surrounding the Jacobean cult of exorcism. And while important, this is, ch this is a tangential concern here. However, Greenblatt does insist on the play's secularism, and his term emptied out is key for this discussion, because it's clear that in the very first scene of this play, Lear is, intentionally or not, voiding his self, emptying himself out, evacuating himself. The division of the kingdom, together with its parceling out, is a kind of self-division, or fragmentation, which drives a wedge between the king's two bodies. The fool will later draw attention to this act of splitting by referring to the eggshell and the peas cod, both fissured and both empty. And the clefting and voiding of Lear's reason is similarly figured. Thou hast paired thy wit of both sides and left nothing in the middle. Lear's abdication, then, is a kind of political enema, evacuating all monarchical power, and it happens so quickly that we almost miss it. Lear's opening line is a command, attend the lords of France and Burgundy, Gloucester. Gloucester's response is immediate and submissive, I shall, my lord. Fewer than a hundred lines later, a similar command is issued, call France, who stirs, call Burgundy. The impatient and anxious question, which itself splits Lear's decree in two, demonstrates the evacuation of his regal self. Within the space of just seven lines, Kent refers to his king as Royal Lear and Old Man. It is a metamorphosis of alacrity and degradation, and it will lead on the heath to the violent confrontation of the human and the elemental. Lear's linguistic impotence takes place in public. Fie, 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 pa, pa, kill, 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 howl, 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 never, 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 never. Paradoxically, his moments of greatest eloquence are saved for the wind, rude, persistent, and indifferent. You cataracts and hurricanoes, spout till you have drenched our steeples, drown the cocks, you sulphurous and thought executing fires, vaunt couriers, oak cleaving thunderbolts, singe my white head, and thou all shaking thunder, strike flat the thick rotundity of the world. The oak cleaving thunderbolts in King Lear are the natural air and air. H-E-I-R and A-I-R, to Nicholas's thunder-dent fart, the lightning bolt, the flash of flame, as the fart is combusted by Absalom's flaming coulter in the Miller's Tale, a flare so bright that it nearly strikes the viewer blind. With the stroke, he was almost yblent, blinded. Much virtue in that almost. In the comic universe of the Miller's Tale, the agony is temporary. Unlike Gloucester's, the blindness is short-lived. In the anguished world of Shakespeare's play, by contrast, there is never relief. Nature, goddess of the wicked Edmund, protracts the agony well beyond breaking point. He hates him that would upon the rack of this tough world stretch him out longer. Harris underlies this overlap between violence in the natural world and that undergone by the protagonist himself. She writes, Shakespeare had dared to make no distinction between the storm and the man who experiences it. Lear, as we hear before we see him on the heath, is minded like the weather. As you and Fernie's recently argued of King Lear, human self and physical world are interpenetrating in Shakespeare's play. The language of the heath, then, is the momentous rhetoric that qualifies King Lear as Shakespeare's most canonical tragedy, the most significant epic since the Divine Comedy. But it is this momentousness, unabashed, but this is a momentousness, sorry, unabashed by cosmic flatulence. Rumble thy bellyful. Lear's tempestuous outburst draws attention to the superfluity, the redundancy, the wastefulness of nature's destruction. Opposed to the thought executing fires and oak cleaving thunderbolts is the white head of a man more sinned against than sinning. It is an image of the impotence of humanity against the force not of the supernatural but of the natural, what Lear himself calls the enmity of the air, all the more apocalyptic for its ordinariness. In its examination of the sufferings of poor naked wretches against the pitiless and rude wind, 
Shakespeare's play collapses the distinctions between canonicity and physicality, folding, in, folding each into the other. In his pervasive exploration of palpable weakness, hunger, waste and shit, the excruciating agony of King Lear demands that its very canonicity be registered in terms of embodiment. Thank you. Peter, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you to all three. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm really sorry. We're on a very tight schedule today and we're not going to have time for any questions. But all is not lost. Because what you now need to do is to come back tomorrow morning at 10.30, please, and ask the questions that you would have liked to ask now. I would have said as well, even if we'd had the time for the questions, overnight, if there's anything that you want to ask about these subjects, but anything else about Shakespeare, we have five of the greatest scholars in our midst. And for two hours tomorrow morning, we can talk about what we want. So please bring back the questions at 10.30 for today and any others that are in your minds that anything at all about Shakespeare, they're here. Drain them dry. <laughs> we have to go. Those of you who are going on Paul's Shakespeare walk, Paul, Dr. Paul Richards, would you remain here if you have tickets? Because that might be the easiest way to sort of get everybody together. Apart from that, if we could exit as soon as possible, that would be equally helpful. Thank you. And Peter, Alison and John.